I, again, am John Kostiak, Executive Director of the National Whistleblower Center, and your co-host, along with the Center's Board Chair, FBI Whistleblower Jane Turner. Thanks, Jane, for all you have done in police reform and all you continue to do for whistleblowers. Thank you, John. Get in good trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. Those are the words of Representative John Lewis, speaking atop the Edmund Pettus Bridge just a few months before he passed. I could not think of a better way to open up today's conference. Our conference focuses on how whistleblowers are helping the world by getting into good trouble, necessary trouble. Everyone knows that the whistleblowers get into trouble. When you expose corruption by powerful people, attempts at retaliation and intimidation will almost surely follow. What I would like to emphasize today is the good and necessary part of Mr. Lewis's injunction. Good trouble to me means trouble through nonviolence. Gandhi, Mandela, King, and Lewis have all shown us this is not just about de escalating violence. The affirmative practice of nonviolence is incredibly powerful and effective. So, what does John Lewis mean when he says get into necessary trouble? In my view, that means addressing serious wrongdoing, wrongdoing that simply cannot and must not be tolerated in a civilized society. In a civilized society, a white police officer would not feel so protected by institutional racism that he can murder a black man with his knee on the man's neck for over eight minutes in front of witnesses and expect no consequences. In a civilized society, large companies would not send their workers to tend to those sick and dying from COVID-19 or those providing other essential services and not take the simple steps to protect them from the disease. And no one would use COVID funds to buy a Lambert Guinea sports car. A civilized society would not allow one community after another to be destroyed by wildfires and floods intensified by climate change and not hold accountable those who illegally conceal the climate change threat just so they can make more money. Whistleblowers cause good trouble because they know it's necessary trouble to fix these and other grave injustices. I am so excited about the many excellent speakers who have come today, together today for today's conference, including whistleblowers, key leaders from the federal executive branch and beyond. I would like to acknowledge in particular Steve Cohen, NWC's co-founder and board chair, who will be on our final panel. And I would like to especially give mention to our two keynote speakers, Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley, the tireless champion of whistleblowers, who has been our leader in Congress for over three decades, and who is rolling out an important new initiative today. California Representative Jackie Speer, who is leading efforts in the House to better protect COVID-19 whistleblowers. I would now like to turn over the microphone to Jane Turner, who will give us a few opening thoughts and introduce our first speaker. Thank you, John. Thank you to the National Whistleblower Center and uh, everyone else who is uh, in so much support of whistleblowers. And I, I wish to say welcome to the whistleblowers, allies, friends, and family members. I am Jane Turner, an FBI whistleblower, and I am delighted to welcome you to National Whistleblower Day 2020. This year is different due to coronavirus, and we still have not gotten our Rose Garden ceremony, but we are alive and kicking and have witnessed incredible events concerning whistleblowers. Events that have changed the politics, the perception, and direction of this country. Never say that your actions have not had an impact because every whistleblower brings a little more light into a world yearning for the truth. No matter where you reside, your efforts to bring truth to light will be the light that starts a spark that which grows into a flame which becomes an inferno each and every whistleblower has contributed to the moral universe whistleblowers build on the whistleblowers before them in case law in support and in number you will never be alone you will never be forgotten we will not back down we will not be cowed and we will not despair. I know it sometimes feels like others are building on our bones, 
and we want to do something for whistleblowers today. Contact me and we will get your story out there with links to your media presence or crowdfunding. Again, you are not alone and you are not forgotten. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Lorenzo Davis. Lorenzo spent 23 years in the Chicago Police Department, got his law degree in 1991, and retired from the force in 2004. He joined the Independent Police Review Authority, which reviewed allegations of police misconduct. Before Lorenzo, there had been 400 police shootings, 70 dead, and every one noted as justified. Lorenzo found cases that were unjustified, but his supervisor commanded him to change the unjustified to justified. Lorenzo believed in doing what was right, what was fair, and what was just. He refused to change the designation and was forced to leave. Ladies and gentlemen, Lorenzo Davis, Esquire. Lorenzo, glad to have you here. Uh, thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, I was looking for my picture. Okay. Go ahead, Lorenzo. Okay, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I wanted to mention that there have been uh, more uh, police officer and violence shootings uh, going back a number of years, hundreds of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, that 400 figure that you mentioned uh, was uh, those uh, civilians who were shot during the time that I worked at the Independent Police Review Authority. Uh, it had replaced the old Office of Professional Standards, which have failed to hold police officers accountable for excessive force or uh, say non-justified shootings, uh, they came up with the Independent Police Review Authority, which was created in 2007. Uh, I joined uh, the IPRA, as we call it, uh, in 2008. And from the time I was there, from 2008 to uh, there were over 400 officer and vile shootings and over 70 of those individuals were killed. Now, from 2008, uh, I began to uh, notice that, of course, uh, some of these shootings were very questionable. Uh, before I actually uh, investigated them, I was on what they call the uh, major incident response team, where I went out to uh, officer involved shootings and other uh, uh, excessive force uh, incidents. And I noticed some really troubling uh, shootings at that time. Finally, I was assigned to uh, excessive force cases and officer involved shootings. And I resolved to do what was right, what was just, uh, and uh, call it like I saw it. My investigations uh, led to uh, me to conclude that some of these officer and vile shootings were not justified, and I said so. At the same time that I began to, uh, say, investigate these shootings, technology uh, was improved drastically. Uh, in addition to what we call police observation devices on uh, poles, uh, telephone poles and the like, uh, you had dash cam uh, cameras on squad cars. And even today you have uh, police officers wearing uh, body cameras. It just, at the same time, society changed and that almost everyone has a cell phone today that can take pictures or video. Now, observing uh, those videos, uh, 
you can see and everyone can see now is very transparent that uh, police officers are engaging in excessive force. And some of these officer involved shootings are, I hate to say it, they're murderers. Some of them are murderers. Uh, I had not a problem uh, while I was at the Independent Police Review Authority and uh, reaching the uh, actual conclusions that some of these shootings were not justified. I was promoted to a supervisor and had a team of six in uh, 2010. But then in 2012, we got a new chief administrator. And I felt perhaps he must have had a hidden agenda because he decided that uh, no officer involved shooting was uh, not justified. They were all justified. And he engaged in various practices, including uh, ordering me to change uh, conclusions that I had reached uh, on shootings, uh, deciding that they were not justified to justify it, uh, which I refused to do. Uh, and ultimately, what occurred was uh, I was given a direct order to change uh the findings on one particular case and i refused to do that i was told that i better had it changed by the the following day and what i did was i uh took off a few days to think about it and i came back and uh simply uh added one line to that particular case uh the case read all of the uh evidence uh showed that the shooting was not justified. And I, my analysis and my conclusion was that it was not justified. But then I had a line to say that uh, the first deputy chief uh, decided it is justified. They turned it in. Uh, they considered, uh, the chief administrator considered me to be a smart aleck at the time. And uh conditions went from bad to worse i got a uh performance evaluation after over two years of not getting one my previous one was excellent by the uh chief administrator when he was the first deputy chief administrator but he decided that to give me a marginal rating and i challenged that and uh wrote uh a uh, at, asking for a review and the uh, performance rating that he gave me uh, listed a number of cases, uh, excessive force cases and officer of our shooting cases uh, that I had determined were sustained or uh, not justified shootings and the performance rating said that because of that, because I had made them uh, not sustained, or rather uh, not sustained and or uh, not justified, uh, it was determined that my performance rating would be lowered. I uh, refuted that. I was asked to come into the office one day to, soon after that, to go over my review uh, that I had written, and I was handing a letter uh, which said uh, I was terminated, and I was walked out of the office. Lorenz, may I ask you, um, you know, while you were working at IPRA, you took time off to think about the implications of following the new administrator's orders to change cases from unjustified to justified. What was the turning point for you in your decision to not change those reports. And I'm gonna to have to ask you to keep the answer pretty brief because we have Representative Spear ready to go. She's got a vote coming up. And so we're gonna to have to move really fast on this. Thanks. Okay, I never had any intention of ever changing my conclusions. Okay. Um, and what changes um, made those, the those, those few days that I took off, I simply uh, thought about what would occur if I was considered to be insubordinate. And uh. You know, I right. decided that I would run the risk. 
What lessons do you think the police departments can learn from your case, Lorenzo? Uh, now everything, every case is, is much more transparent than it is now and police departments must hold uh, police officers accountable. You can't cover these things up anymore as we have seen uh, lately with all of the demonstrations all over America. Thank you, Lorenzo. And his full interview will be on Frontline Whistleblower News this Friday. Thank you so much. And back to John. Thank you, Jane and Lorenzo. So I now have the great pleasure of introducing Representative Jackie Spear from California. Representative Spear is a fearless fighter for women's equality, LGBTQ rights, and the disenfranchised. She has dedicated her life to eliminating government corruption while working to strengthen America's national and economic security. As co-chair of the House Whistleblower Protection Caucus, we know we can count on her to fight for whistleblowers, no matter what the obstacles. Right now, as she'll explain, she is, leading a le is playing a leading role in fighting for better protection for those who expose wrongdoing in the COVID-19 response. So please uh, send your questions over the chat box. I know that a Congresswoman would like to hear from you. Let's now turn it over to Representative Spear. Thank you, John. And um, thanks to uh, Lorenzo for um, his courage and for being a hero. You know, uh, today, the House of Representatives is mourning the, the passing of one of our great heroes, John Lewis, who is, um, whose funeral is being held in Atlanta, Georgia. And what most whistleblowers do is do what John Lewis did follow the truth, move forward, cross that bridge when he knew he was gonna be arrested because he was going to do the right thing. Um, today, as we all know, is National Whistleblowers Day and um, it is something to celebrate, but it's also something um, to observe that we still need more protections for whistleblowers in this country. Um, I'm reminded of how whistleblowers first came to be in this country. It dates back to the Continental Congress uh, when the first whistleblower protection bill was passed in 1778. And what led to the passage were actions, again, by two heroes in 1777. They were two naval officers, Samuel Shaw and Ray Richard Maven, who revealed that British POWs were being tortured by the commander in chief of the Continental Navy. When they blew the whistle, they were in fact charged with criminal libel and imprisoned. But they did what I think whistleblowers often do is they petitioned and they petitioned the Continental Congress uh, and the Continental Congress unanimously passed uh, the very first whistleblower protection law. Uh, and what they did at the same time was release all the documents associated with the allegations, which for all intents and purposes was the first automatic FOIA um, that had been created, but it took us, what, centuries to um, recognize the importance of doing that with everything. So um, the Continental Congress also voted to pay for the defense of those two soldiers and um, they ended up paying a whopping $1,418 uh, for their defense, and they were both found not guilty. As evidenced by Shaw and Maven's story, whistleblowers are moral compasses, just like uh, John Lewis has been a moral compass for the Congress of the United States. And in these very difficult times too often, um, we see retaliation and retribution for whistleblowers. So any whistleblower who has that moral compass has to think twice, do I really want to do this and face um, what may come to me? Um, the biggest beneficiary, as we know, of whistleblowers are the American people, are the taxpayers. Um, we've already seen whistleblowers shine the spotlight on truth in COVID-19. and in part, that is why this legislation that I have introduced along with my colleague, Jamie Reskin, and my colleague, um, um, Ms. Harris, is an effort to recognize that there are going to be bad actors. There are gonna be people trying to take advantage of this horrific pandemic. 
Um, they are going to try and fleece the taxpayers of whatever money they can, and we've already seen it. Um, it came to my attention that a company called Billikit was formed merely six days before receiving a federal contract for $10 million to provide COVID-19 testing supplies. Now, it was a whistleblower within that company that came forward and said, these are being prepared in unsanitary conditions and created some oversight and accountability. Um, there was also a, a Florida man who got a PPP loan for $4 million. And you know what he did with that loan? He bought himself a Lamborghini and went on a shopping spree. So um, the other issues that we're finding with Paycheck Protection Program is that um, LLCs that um, are being identified as separate businesses when in fact they're all run by the same person. Uh, one is a company called Vibra Healthcare, a chain of hospitals and therapy centers with an annual a revenue stream of $1 billion. And they received as much as $97 million in federal funds in the Paycheck Protection Program that was specified for small businesses. And they did that by applying as 26 separate LLCs, limited liability companies. 23 of the loans came from the same bank, and almost all of the approvals happened on the very same day in April. So with trillions, truly trillions of dollars of taxpayer money, more money than we actually appropriate every year, we're spending it in months. And the opportunity for fraud and abuse is great, and that's why um, I have introduced the COVID-19 Whistleblower Protection Act so that Persons who work for companies would have the same kinds of protections that individuals who work for the federal government have. So I'm hopeful that we will get this passed. It will guarantee that they have access to jury trials, administrative relief, um, and that their identities will be protected. Now, having said that, I can't begin to tell you how deeply troubled I have been by this president in his egregious conduct in taking out whistleblowers. Um, whether it's Michael Atkinson, who is the Inspector General for the Intelligence uh, Agency and who followed the letter of the law, someone who had been a state, had been a, a U.S. attorney and worked in the Department of Justice for his entire career till we, he became the Inspector General, who was a Republican himself. But because he followed the law, and pursued the whistleblowers' allegations and found that they were both urgent and material, um, he lost his job as Inspector General. And then, of course, um, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who um, also came forward and who was unceremoniously um, taken from the White House and has decided now to retire uh, because his promotion was in jeopardy. Um, Rick Bright Spate, the um, great uh, leader in um, the program that looks at uh, all of the pandemic and medical um, needs, had said that if we don't do a national coordinated response to COVID-19, uh, this year, that we will have the darkest winter in modern history. And we are on that path because persons with integrity, with intelligence, with skills, with expertise are not being listened to. So having said all that, um, I don't want to discourage anyone from becoming a whistleblower. Um, if I did nothing else in my life, but could say that I blew the whistle on some form of fraud or abuse, um, I will feel that I have done something for my country and I hope every whistleblower uh, feels like that. Uh, I and so many here in Congress wanna protect you. We want to make sure the laws 
are um, stronger. We're trying to do that right now in the reauthorization of the um, Intelligence Act. And I, for one, won't support anything that doesn't make changes to that act so that persons like Inspector General Atkinson uh, would be protected in the future. So with that, John, I will um, complete my comments and welcome your questions. Thank you, Congresswoman. So many important points you've made, and I'm going to apologize. We have Senator Grassley coming on at 12:30 or the bottom of the hour for people that are not in this time zone. And so, um, what I'd like to do is see if I can combine a few of the questions that have come across on the screen. Uh, there obviously is a lot of people quite concerned about the fate of whistleblowers in the past year, as uh, essentially whistleblowers got caught up in uh, partisan warfare, and they were just doing their duty. Um, and so a lot of people want to know, is there a way to restore the long history of bipartisan support for whistleblowers that we have enjoyed for most of our history? Uh, I know we have Senator Grassley coming on the line, but are you getting any signals of uh, warmth or support from any of your members across the aisle on the House side? Well, there are members on the Republican side of the aisle that recognize the great value that whistleblowers provide. I mean, there's no greater Republican ally and advocate for whistleblowers than the senator. And I think when all the dust settles after this election, um, hopefully we can come together and I would hope that I could work with the senator in doing something that really plugs the holes that have been, uh, been, been abused um, and make sure that we have a whistleblower protection law that's airtight uh, so that future whistleblowers won't um, be subject to this kind of um, gross conduct. All right, my final question, how can we in the whistleblower community help you, uh, especially uh, this moment you have to better protect COVID-19 whistleblowers? What, is, uh, what can we be doing to help? Well, I think part of what you can do is spread the word, um, encourage you know, your family and friends across the country to um, support the bill, co-sponsor the bill, uh, we truly want to see this protection put in place because there's so much money at stake and there are just bad actors out there, regrettably, and they need to be called to task. So we want to make sure that uh, people feel that we have their back. So that would be number one. Um, send me your uh, whistleblower um, concerns. Uh, if you have recommendations on how we can tighten the laws, um, I'm all ears because I feel so strongly uh, about this issue. I've worked on this issue uh, for my entire career in government, and um, I know that we can do so much good by having uh, your eyes and ears on the ground, uh, identifying when there is waste, fraud, and abuse so that we can um, rid ourselves of it. Congresswoman, I cannot thank you enough for joining us here today, and most importantly, for your leadership in the House of Representatives on the, for the cause of whistleblowing. We know there's a lot of work left to be done, and we're looking forward to continuing and strengthening our partnership. Thank you. It's great being with you. Thank you. I'm now going to turn over the proceedings to Dean Zerby. Um, Dean Zerby is a senior policy analyst at the National Whistleblower Center and a partner at the Zerby Miller Finger Law Firm, where he is a fierce advocate for whistleblowers. From 2006 to 2018, oh, served as counsel and tax counsel for the Senate Finance Committee for then Chairman Charles Grassley. Dean, all yours. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. And I am so thrilled to see the Senator. Uh, great to see you, Senator. I'm going to just do a quick introduction uh, for you. I would just say it's probably the greatest of my honors to be able to introduce my longtime boss, uh, Senator Charles E. Grassley. He is truly the patron saint of whistleblowers. He believes in whistleblowers in his bones. He thinks they are just so vital in terms of government oversight, government accountability, and protecting taxpayer dollars. And that goes regardless of who is in power. He is out there advocating for the whistleblowers. And I think, Senator, that may be a little bit like the uh, skunks at the picnic that you want to talk about the whistleblowers. Sometimes you're not that popular for them. But he has done his support for whistleblowers, not only with words, but also deeds. 
Uh, his fingerprints are on every single major piece of legislation protecting whistleblowers or providing whistleblowers uh, rewards for coming forward, including, of course, the False Claims Act has brought in $60 billion. He also authored the tax whistleblower law, which has basically broken the banks in Switzerland, the SEC whistleblower law. It goes on and on. Basically, every single law out there is, you can thank the Senator Grassley for making happen. So, Senator, I apologize. I'm sure if we were in front of an audience, they'd all be cheering and standing for you and your great work. But uh, you can know in your heart that they're doing that. And I will turn it over to you, Senator. They want to hear your good words. Senator, you might be on mute. I'm sorry. You're right. I am on mute. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Can, yes. you, can you hear me? Yes, okay. yes sir. Um, I got comments, but I want to, uh, first of all, thank the center for the support that you give us. Thanks to each individual uh, or group of individuals that are patriotic citizens and uh, let us know what's wrong in government or even in the private sector. Uh, and uh, also to comment on this form of uh, communication with you, because I uh, feel more comfortable being face to face with you. And uh, if, you, if you were here, there'd be a few hundred people. And I understand there's a few thousand people on here now. So I hate to say that there might be something good coming out of the uh, virus pandemic, but I found that uh, these modern methods of communication, which have been around for 20 years, so they aren't so modern, uh, they, uh, they give us an opportunity to communicate with a lot more people. So thanks to the, uh, the thousands of people that are interested in this and for the good work you do. So I'm glad to uh, talk about some whistleblower legislation. I've been working on this uh, uh, and it's very crucial in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, most recently, I've been working on legislation uh, to, uh, I've been working on legislation uh, to strengthen the False Claims Act, uh, the massive increase in government funding to address uh, COVID-19 crisis has created new opportunities for fraudsters trying to cheat the government and steal hard earned taxpayer dollars. And you heard from uh, uh, some of that from the Congresswoman. Ironically, at a time when it's important to encourage whistleblowers to come forward so that we can recover stolen funds, the Justice Department has been continuing uh, its recent practice of dismissing charges uh, in many of the false claims X cases uh, brought by whistleblowers uh, before uh, stating its reasons. Uh, and of course, that's simply not right. Uh, if there are serious allegations of fraud, uh, no less than the attorney general should state the le legitimate reasons for deciding not to pursue them in court. This gets to a point where uh, Dean has heard me use these phrases so much. There needs to be transparency in government. So these decisions ought to be transparent because with transparency brings accountability. My legislation clarifies the ambiguities created by the courts and reigns in this practice that undermines the purpose of my 1986 amendments to the False Claims Act which of course was to empower you whistleblowers. Uh, during the pandemic, there's also been a dramatic increase in whistleblower complaints filed with the Security and Exchange Commission. Whistleblowers have been calling attention uh, to sham artists peddling counterfeit and substandard medical goods and phony cures to cons uh, consumers. Uh, the whistleblower Program Improvement Act is what I call it. Uh, and uh, I introduced it last year, Strengths and Protections for the Security Exchange Commission and Commodity Future Trading Commission whistleblowers. It requires the SEC and the CFTC to make timely decisions regarding whistleblower rewards. 
this is another way of encouraging whistleblowers so you don't get uh, uh, extended and extended and never get an answer and never get an answer. If you want to encourage whistleblowing, you got to let them know that the government is acting on it. Uh, we're now waiting, of course, for the Senate Banking Committee uh, to sign off on the SEC portion of the bill, uh, which uh, the, the Security and Exchange Commission supports. And by the way, I just had a meeting with the chairman of the Security and Exchange Commission, and he has taken to heart over the last year and even listened to whistleblowers, uh, some of the things that I found fault with the Security and Ex Exchange Commission not supporting whistleblowers and getting awards and proper awards out uh, timely. And I think he has met my, uh, uh, has delivered on the suggestions that I've given him. Finally, we've uh, been having a national conversation lately about the role of law enforcement in our society. Law enforcement officials are there to protect the constitutional rights of our citizens and to never do harm or infringe upon those constitutional rights that each of us have under the Constitution. Whenever the Attorney General has cause to believe law enforcement is infringing on those rights, he has the authority to pursue legal action. But the Attorney General can't prosecute what he doesn't know about. Uh, that's why I've been working on legislation that would ensure law enforcement whistleblowers who report violations uh, of American constitutional rights. These protections are uh, more important now than ever. As you know, we've been talking about police now since uh, Mr. Ford's murder, but Congress needs to pick up the pace in order to pass the legislation and the other whistleblower bills that I mentioned before uh, this session comes to an end which probably will be Christmas this year. In coming months, I'll be working hard to see that these bills are, and as I do, I would appreciate your continued support, and I know you're enthusiastic behind what I'm trying to do. Thank you, and I'll, I'll be happy to take some questions. Well, thank you, Senator. That is, uh, I'm out of breath. That's quite a larger list of things you're going to be have on your plate to accomplish but I, I i know i have great faith that if anyone can do it uh you can we have a few questions that we got some of them you kind of touched on all right ready senator but uh maybe a few points for you to elaborate on um what are your thoughts on government contractors claiming they are not responsible for fraud if some government official however corrupt, had knowledge of the fraud. Maybe this is something in your False Claims Act reform. Yeah. Well, lower courts have completely uh, misconstrued uh, dicta opinion by a Supreme Court and uh, read into the law a materiality standard that is not consistent with the actual language of our law. This improper reading has uh, hamstrung the law at a time when the government is uh, spending unprecedented amounts combating uh, the pandemic that we're in. It's critical that Congress uh, shore up the False Claims Act to ensure that it's properly equipped uh, to handle any potential uh, COVID-related fraud. And by the way, Dean, I think at the beginning, I forgot to, Thank you for not only your loyalty to me, but what you've done uh, to, to bring in a lot of money through legislation you, you worked on when I was chairman of the committee and you helped let me get passed. I appreciate that very much. And everybody listening ought to appreciate what Dean <laughs> Zerby has done to help, help the taxpayers. That's, that's very kind of you, Senator. You're, you're the one that makes it all possible though. It's uh, you, you're, you're, the, you're the engine that drives it. Um, but very kind. Another question for you, again, kind of on this False Claims Act provision that you've talked about, what are your thoughts, and, and you touched on it, but maybe elaborate on the government's recent initiatives to dismiss the cases of False Claims Act whistleblowers without giving them an opportunity to be heard. It, it seems like it's kind of your old chestnut about saying, well, from the Bible, rather, I said, you know, but you know, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set ye free. 
Um, tell me a little bit your, your, your thinking on that issue. I spoke to a longer extent on this point that I would tell people within the last hour on the floor is we always use July 30th as National Whistleblower Day because it's the same day that the Continental Congress enacted the first whistleblower uh, uh, law. And, uh, and so it's got a big history, even before we were a country. Uh, the, at least the principal has had. Uh, and it, it works this way, that uh, a relator uh, goes in and says, says something's wrong. He hopes to get the federal government, uh, the Justice Department to help him because if you got the government working with a whistleblower, there's uh, brings more muscle behind it, probably saves the whistleblower uh, some time and money as well and uh, protects the whistleblower to, a, it ought to protect the whistleblower to a greater extent. So then uh, some of these lay around a long time uh, so they don't get acted upon. That discourages whistleblowers. If you say something's wrong and it takes a long time for the government to say, yes, we'll, we'll, we like this one. If they don't like it, uh, then presumably the relator ought to be able to go ahead on his own. But if the Justice Department dismisses it, uh, that hurts the case for the relator going on his own. And so maybe nothing's done to correct or wrong. So uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't say what the Justice Department is doing is wrong, but it's how they're doing it. And they're doing more of it now than ever before. And I, uh, the very least, you know, transparency brings accountability. It's the second time I've said that to you. So they ought to at least say why they're dismissing it. And if they are going to dismiss it to notify uh, the citizen that has come in, and let the citizen argue the other point of view. But right now, it's a one-sided deal. Unfair you, to the tax, unfair to the relator. That's perfect, Senator. Well, Senator, I know we've got to be mindful of your time and schedule. You've been so good. I just leave you with one last thought. You don't need to answer to it, but I know you've been doing great work keeping, you constantly fine tune these your efforts on the SEC and the False Claims Act, I think are right on mark. We need to get those. And I just encourage you to, we've talked about in the past, the National Whistleblower Center sent you a letter is that needs to be needs to be some fine tuning on the great tax whistleblower uh, law that you wrote as well too. And I know uh, that's in your mind, but I hope I uh, encourage you to take a hard look at that as well. Well, thank you and you know I will. You bet. Senator, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I really think it's fantastic news. Uh, thank you, Dean. Uh, Senator, I don't know if everyone realizes the, the significance of what Senator Grassley said, but he sounded like he's cautiously optimistic we can get some strength in the amendments to the False Claims Act. This year, uh, with his leadership, that would be quite an achievement. So, uh, Dean, I really appreciate your moderating us. We're now going to shift over uh, to our next panel. Thank you again, Dean. Um, and I want to introduce um, Susan Kohler. Uh, she is going to be the moderator of our, our panel on uh, COVID-19 whistleblowing. Uh, she is uh, a partner at the Hallen and Law Firm in uh, Minneapolis, one of the firms in uh, National Whistleblower Center's Cooperating Attorney Network. And given Susan's deep expertise in helping whistleblowers in both False Claims Act cases and employment law cases, I can think of no better person to help us think through how whistleblowers can contribute on the COVID-19 crisis, how we can support whistleblowers with this enormous uh, priority. Susan knows quite well how whistleblowers achieve justice in exposing fraud and in protecting themselves from retaliation. So Susan, I wanna thank you for joining us and helping out today, and I'll let you uh, take care of introducing the panel. Thank you very much, John, for that kind introduction. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. As an attorney at Holland and Law that represents whistleblowers in both retaliation and false claims matters, I am honored to introduce the panel here today for you on the role of whistleblowers in relation to public health and economic revitalization. With COVID-19, the work of whistleblowers hits close to home for everyone. We all are potential victims of the virus, we all suffer the economic impact of dealing with COVID-19. And accordingly, we all are dependent on the courage and the commitment of whistleblowers and those who work with them and protect them. 
three of whom I will introduce to you as panelists today. Our first panelist, Jana Porter, is a charge nurse at West Hills Hospital in Los Angeles, which is owned by Hospital Corporation of America, one of the largest for-profit healthcare providers in the world. Ms. Porter is an active union member of SEIU 121RN, shout outs to them. She will tell you her story about the retaliation she experienced trying to protect patients and coworkers in the course of the pandemic. <clears throat> Jana Porter will be followed by Michael Horowitz, whose picture I'm not seeing yet. I'm hoping he's here. Um, I'm on the inspector general. Me. Sorry? He is the Inspector General of the Department of Justice, and he is also the acting chair of the Pandemic Response Account Accountability Committee, I think called PRAC, created by the CARES Act to conduct oversight of the $2.4 trillion allocated to economic recovery related to COVID-19. Now that's a job. He will discuss the importance of whistleblowers in ensuring that these dollars actually contribute to our recovery. And the final speaker will be a protector of whistleblowers, Henry Kerner, Special Counsel of the U.S. Office of Special Counsel. The OSC is an independent agency with the mission of protecting federal employees from prohibited personnel practices, and especially reprisal from whistleblowing. We will learn from Special Counsel Kerner about the types of cases OSC is seeing as a result of COVID-19. And so let us begin with whistleblower Jana Porter. Welcome, Jana. Thank you for that introduction, Susan. Um, I'm a relief charge nurse, which means that I'm responsible for supporting other nurses on my team, essentially during battle. And that's exactly what it's been like to work in a hospital during a pandemic. And when nurses are understaffed without enough PPE, as they are at my hospital, it's like going to war with a hand tied behind your back. I feel a need to protect my coworkers, my patients, the public, and my family. The instinct is the very thing that drove me to become a nurse in the first place. It's also what moved me to speak the truth so that people I care about will be safe. I never set out to be a whistleblower. I certainly never expected that I'd be the focus of media attention or on a panel like this one. Um, but however we got here, I think we all share one thing in common. We hold the truth and the people in positions of power with something to hide don't like that. In my case, telling the truth got me suspended and almost got me fired. And the promotion that they had offered me prior to this is suddenly off the table. If I had to do it over, I'd do it exactly the same way. Um, I work at West Hills Hospital, which is owned by uh, the Hospital Corporation of America, the largest, wealthiest for profit hospital corporation in the nation. HCA is a giant in healthcare and they're powerful. They're also very concerned about their public image, which is something that I learned the hard way. When management decided overnight and without warning that all the COVID patients would be moved to our floor, I sounded the alarm so that my fellow nurses could be prepared. Um, we already didn't have enough PPE and now we're going to be working at ground zero where we'd all be potentially exposed. I wanted my coworkers to be safe, so I posted a message to a private Facebook group that we use at work. We're only members that are people that we work alongside me in the telemetry unit. I told them what was happening, which room numbers the positive COVID patients were going into, um, and to be ready for it. This was around March 19th. Um, on March 24th, I publicly posted on Facebook, my personal Facebook page about the lack of PPE and asked for donations from the community to be given directly to nurses, not to management. Um, I said, I need anything I can get. Thank you for everyone for praying for our staff and donating and uh, what they can for nurses. Um, the same day an ER nurse wrote on his Facebook, our administrators are not giving out masks unless patients are suspected of COVID, um, but that's not acceptable. Um, by then we'd already been exposed. So please donate to someone you know in the medical field. Um, the next day they put us both on suspension pending investigation. That wasn't easy as they ghosted us for 10 solid days during a pandemic when they need staff. 
Um, instead of crawling into a hole and staying quiet at home, I decided to speak up. I did interviews with Bloomberg, Bloomberg, excuse me, Vox, LA Times, New York Times, was on CBS News and more. Somehow I even ended up on Dr. Phil, who was particularly upset about whistleblowers being silenced. You never know who's gonna be on your side. In the end, I was called back to work, but not with open arms. They stated a month later that they let me come back to work because I'm a great nurse, yet also called me a liar and asked why I didn't use my platform to make them look good. For now, I'm back at the bedside, not made charge nurse much anymore. Um, in fact, there's a directive not to make me charge nurse anymore. Yet I'm still speaking up for safety and I've been told there's a big target on my back. Um, intimidating nurses, so they don't ask for help from their community, does not flatten the curve. Um, it only makes the situation worse. HCA is still doing that. They're retaliating against others who speak out against unsafe conditions in their hospitals. Um, my union, SCIU 121RN, put out a petition to the California Attorney General um, telling him to stick up for HCA employees who go public with the truth. You can find that petition at bit.ly backslash ag dash whistleblower. Um, the link will be in the chat. If you want to support us, please sign the petition. Um, in a public health crisis, uh, telling the truth is a life-saving act and we must do it no matter what the risks are. I'm gonna keep doing that. I encourage all nurses across the country to do the same and to not be afraid of their employer. Um, this is what we need to do. And um, thank you for having me on and I appreciate it. Thank you, Shana. Your story is unfortunately one that we've heard a lot and uh, we applaud your courage in speaking up. We're going to move on now to um, Inspector General Michael Horowitz. Uh, who, as I said before, is the acting chair of the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee. Mr. Mr. Horowitz, are you here? I'm here on the phone. I, we have been unsuccessful getting my camera to work, even though the uh, camera on my computer, my laptop shows it's working. So I apologize for that. It worked during the tests. Um, but it is great to be here. I'm glad you can at least hear me. Um, and I can see all of you. So I'm glad to be part of this event, which is always a great event to be part of. Um, and um, I um, am happy to offer a few words about where we are in the pandemic relief oversight efforts. Um, we're dealing as a community with um, uh, $2.5 trillion so far that has gone out the door. And we're dealing with a healthcare crisis that um, Jonna has spoken to about the issues facing workers, um, healthcare professionals across the country, issues facing federal employees, um, challenges in many different areas in our oversight responsibilities. <clears throat> Upwards of 40 or so IGs have responsibility over funds that have gone to the agencies they oversee. And our eyes and ears are gonna be the whistleblowers that that need to come forward and it is critical that they come forward and feel comfortable coming forward to report to us about uh, abuses, whether it's in regard to the uh, $2 trillion plus that has gone out the door, um, whether it relates to um, the healthcare challenges that our hospitals and other healthcare professionals are facing. Um, we need folks to come forward and that's why in the IG community and working with Henry Kerner and his folks at the Office of Special Counsel, it's been so important for us to ensure that whistleblowers feel comfortable coming forward. I certainly echo the comments of Senator Grassley, Congresswoman Spire, who've been leaders in these efforts. Um, it it is been a challenging situation with regard to whistleblowers as um, you know, um, last year, um, we, SIGI, the SIGI community, sent a letter um, to the Office of Special Counsel about its decision in connection with the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act, the importance of encouraging whistleblowers to come forward, not discouraging them, ensuring that complaints get to the right place. 
um, what we've done on the pandemic committee. Um, and if you go to pandemic.oversight.gov, you'll see our website. We've created a hotline specifically for pandemic related issues. Um, we've also created um, a um, series of dynamic web pages so that the public um, can see how the money is, is being spent, where it's going to. And that's something we'll continue to push forward for the reasons Senator Grassley mentioned about the importance of transparency and accountability. The public has a right to know how its money is being spent. The public has a right to know whether the money is going to the right places. And the public has a right to know what the outcomes are. And our eyes and ears are the grounds. On the ground are all of the employees all of the people who touch those funds, who are the healthcare professionals, who see what's going on, and we're gonna do everything we can to continue to support their efforts to be able to come forward to us as an IG community, um, and so that we can undertake the oversight that we need to in, in regard to this pandemic. So it's, it's great to be here. I'm sorry I can't be there uh, in person or by video, but um, I'm, it's always enjoyable. Uh, to be part of this group. Thank you, Susan, and, and I want to thank the center for pulling, putting this together in this virtual forum this year. Thank you so much, uh, Inspector General Horowitz. We'll have a few questions for you in a, after we're finished hearing from Mr. or from Special Counsel Kerner. So, uh, would you like to speak now, uh, Special Counsel? Of course, thank you, Susan, very much. I um, want to say uh, uh, I really appreciate being invited to participate today. I'm reminded that I actually spoke at this very event in 2017 while I was still just an appointee and had not yet been confirmed. So I've always been very interested in coming to this event and obviously I appreciate the center for putting it on in this virtual format. I also wanna reach out and thank you to Ms. Porter for her courage in speaking out and to Michael Horowitz, um, the IG community and Siggy specifically and Michael specifically have been incredibly important allies in our, in our uh, efforts to protect whistleblowers and to make sure that they know that we're a safe channel that they can come to and and uh, bring bring knowledge of of various violations to bear, and that we're going to protect them. We're going to protect their anonymity if 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 they wish, and also make sure that we try to get the best results. And so, I wanted to say a few words about how COVID has impacted the Office of Special Counsel. Like most workplaces across the country, 2020 has been a challenging year for us at OSC. Obviously, we've had to contend with the pandemic. We've also experienced mounting civil unrest across the country. And yet, in the face of these strong headwinds, we have nonetheless managed to continue our service to federal whistleblowers by ensuring the expeditious processing of whistleblower complaints. Now, overall complaints have been somewhat down this year, but we have exceeded our targets for how many whistleblowers we have helped. Last quarter, so that's the period from April through June, um, while our staff were subject to precautionary mandatory telework, OSC has obtained the highest number of favorable actions. Sorry about that. Um, sorry, I had to close out. Um, anyway, we've ob obtained the, um, the highest number of favorable actions in our history and of 105. And so we're on track to exceed last year, which already was our highest, high, uh, highest number of favorable actions with 303. So I'm very proud of the productivity. Obviously, when you're a manager of an agency uh, during a health pandemic, one of the main things you, you're focused on is the health and safety of your employees. And so we wanted to make sure that our employees' health is taken care of. We went to mandatory telework very early on. We also have, uh, we're in the sort of phase A return to work, but phase A really just means there's very few people here. Uh, there are obviously uh, protections in the office itself, um, but you really have to make sure that not only are you still, uh, are you protecting the employees, but you're also getting, getting the work done for the whistleblowers and the stakeholders. Uh, I'd like to share a few examples of our actions in response to the pandemic. So we got our first COVID-19 related whistleblower disclosure on February 27th. And we've seen a rise in the number of health and safety disclosures from federal employees since that time. So in response, I established an internal coronavirus task force to facilitate communication and bring significant resources to bear across our multiple units handling COVID cases. With the diligence of, of its members, OSC's coronavirus task force has succeeded in swiftly assessing COVID-related disclosures to ensure rapid referral for investigation in appropriate cases. 
While most of our intake initially consisted of disclosures of health and safety risks, and we're talking about the things that uh, Ms. Porter talked about, for example, insufficient PPE, more lately, uh, or lately, we have seen more of an uptick in uh, retaliation cases. So to date, our OSC task force has received 73 whistleblower disclosures and 92 complaints of prohibited personnel practices related to COVID-19. Now, one of the things the COVID task force has really, has, has really excelled at is trying to achieve what we call course corrections or quick corrective actions, where OSC attorneys have intervened early to put the parties on a better path before more significant harm developed. Especially right now, it can be life-saving to give an immunocompromised employee safer working conditions or help a parent obtain much-needed leave from his or her employee. Now, in addition to the recent influx of COVID cases, we've had other disclosures related to health and safety, which have resulted in improved aviation safety, better care for veterans at VA hospitals, and safer workplaces. From improper EPA-lead-based paint inspections to VA patients exposed to asbestos at medical centers, OSC has worked with whistleblowers to protect vulnerable Americans and federal workers. And that's the important thing. We have tried very hard, even in the, in the pandemic, to make sure that, that federal workers know that we're there, we're gonna support them. Uh, we've asked for filings to be electronically, or we have a Form 14 for folks. And uh, I've been very proud of the work that the, that the uh, people here at OSC have done under very difficult circumstances and really achieved unparalleled success working with whistleblowers and agencies to address and prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Susan, and thank you again for letting me address. Uh, thank you so much, Special Counsel Kerner. Uh, we have received some questions, so I'm eager to let the panelists uh, continue to share uh, their experiences with us. We've received a, a question from an HHS whistleblower commenting on the difficulty it is in the current environment to to blow the whistle, uh, given sort of the lack of support in the executive side of um, the government, um, the slowness of processes sometimes, and the fact that there's no MSB P PB in place to address appeals. Uh, perhaps both um, IG Horowitz and SC Kerner can respond to this. Are there efforts to address those issues, to fill those gaps, to expedite the um, resolution of, of the claims brought by whistleblowers? Um, so, Michael, I'll, I'll start. Um, obviously, uh, not having an MSPB is a problem. I completely agree. Uh, the OSC, as we obviously go to the MSPB for several things. In fact, I'm sure many in the sophisticated audience know this, but uh, OSC was part of MSPB. In fact, my official title in some doc government documents is still special counsel of the MSPB. So we really need a board to validate a lot of our actions. Fin finality is one of them, getting stay author or getting stays granted is another. Uh, there are some nominees that are currently pending in the Senate. Uh, in fact, there are three for the three uh, three members of the board. Um, I do not know at this point if the Senate's going to take action on them and, uh, and confirm them, but they are on the Senate floor, so they could be confirmed pretty much any time. Uh, as for the first part of the question, as an independent agency, you know, uh, OSC really tries to very hard to, sh to, to keep that independence and, and regardless of who may be in, in, in the executive authority, whether the president's a Democrat, Republican, uh, we are independent of that executive. And so we will protect whistleblowers. We have statutes to protect anonymity and we will protect whistleblowers against any kind of encroachment and provide what I called earlier the safe channel to make sure that people know they can come to us. Thanks. Um... Mr. Yep. Horowitz, would you like to respond? Yeah, um, I completely agree with everything Henry just said. I think you will, uh, it, what's critically important here for the IG community is to do what I think we've con we have been doing and will continue to do, um, which is to follow the law, to not be deterred in taking the steps that as IGs were required to take. Um, you see that at the HHS OIG and the reports they're putting out. You saw that with the um, actions taken by other IGs, including IG Atkinson in following the law as he uh, was obligated to do. Um, we continue to work with um, Henry and his staff on whistleblower matters. Um, we took an oath to um, follow the law, uphold the law. 
Um, and whistleblowers need to know that when they come to us, we will carry out our duties. I know sometimes it takes longer than we'd like. Um, these are complicated matters often. We need to get to the bottom of them. They need to be thorough. The last thing we can um, have happen is that we get accused of doing shortcuts um, or doing something quick and, and, and a slapdash effort in some ways. So we're going to have to be thorough. There needs to be an MSPB, as Henry said, to handle these issues. But whistleblowers should know that the IG community is working closely with the Office of Special Counsel on matters that come to us of importance and will continue to do so. Thank you very much. I've got a question for you, Jana. Um, did you worry about losing your job after you blew the whistle? That's part of the question. And were you made aware of your rights as a whistleblower? And there's sort of a third part to that question. Um, how can our community help people like you in your situation? Um, I, I was afraid to lose my job. Um, however, when the media started to reach out to me and start to interview me, I realized that I had an extremely um, fortunate opportunity to speak up for nurses. Um, and it became more about that than about losing my job. Um, I've worked there for almost eight years. I've never had an issue um, until this um, had happened. So it was quite shocking. Um, I actually had um, a little bit of like a remorse or guiltful feeling that they had created, um, which I now realize was their purpose all along. Um, looking back, I don't feel like I, I still don't feel like I did anything wrong when you're protecting safety of yourself and others and staff. How can that be a bad thing? Um, I still feel like um, speaking up um, could get me in quite a bit of trouble. So um, I do it in different ways now. And um, I constantly encourage doctors sp to speak up as well because um, there's less repercussion for them. Um, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Well, the last part was just what, what can we do as a community to help you in the things that you're trying to accomplish? Um, that's a good question. Um, well, to start, we have the petition that we submitted to Attorney um, General Xavier Becerra asking him to investigate and take action into the retaliation against HCA healthcare, in particular against um, retaliating against whistleblowers. Um, this includes unsafe staffing, um, rationing of the PPE, um, and poor COVID-19 infection monitoring. Um, we're currently having to reuse the same gown over and over for different patients. We're wearing one mask for the entire day. Um, they're trying to take away N95s um, now from us, which is what has been protecting us um, this whole time. Um, so starting with the petition helps um, definitely. And then, um, you know, just enforcing laws that help protect whistleblowers. I never even really knew what a whistleblower was. I've heard of it, but I didn't have any idea until recently what that even meant and that there were even laws protecting us. I had no idea. So more education would probably be very useful. Yeah, that's, yeah, also for starters, yes. Jana raises an interesting point when she talked about how the opportunity to actually be public about her whistleblowing gave her a, a, a platform that she didn't realize that she might have. And it raises an interesting question about the role of confidentiality in whistleblowing. And um, I know in, in the private employment world, uh, it's very unusual that whistleblowers can remain confidential. It's, you know, we advise our clients all the time that, you know, you're, you're going to be known. And right. so I'd be interested in um, the response of the government folks about kind of how they see confidentiality playing as a positive and perhaps not always a positive um, uh, element of how they how you handle retaliation claims and whistleblowing claims. Right. And I'd be curious um, how often yep. you have people who really insist on remaining anonymous. Um, 
I can start with that, Susan. Um, it's a great question, and um, China raises some very important and challenging issues that she personally had to go through that I know whistleblowers have to go through. And I'll, um, I, I do think that in it, it's very important for us as IGs to respect the decision of whistleblowers. The law provides that we maintain confidentiality. We do everything we can as IGs to inform whistleblowers of their rights to confidentiality. Um, obviously, there are certain legal situations where we can't um, um, stop disclosures to, from occurring if there's a court order or some other situations like that, but we do everything in our power to maintain confidentiality. Um, I think anecdotally, as I sit here, I would say in most instances, uh, whistleblowers want, prefer to remain anonymous, um, not have their identities disclosed, um, and that's precisely for the reasons uh, John indicated, which is concern, legitimate concern over their jobs, over their careers, over the implications of what will happen to them if, they're in, if information comes out. And, you know, I've spoken before about this as a young prosecutor back in the 1990s, I hate to say it. Um, I did a lot of law enforcement corruption cases in New York City when I was a prosecutor up there for the federal government. And hearing from Mr. Davis and others today talk about the challenges they faced is reminiscent of what I had to deal with, with police officers who wanted to come forward and report misconduct. If they reported it, if it became public, um, the, the Serpico movie, for those who've seen Serpico, wasn't far off. They were risking their lives by doing that. Um, and so there, there's a very challenging issue for whistleblowers and we as as uh, IGs um, and in my case dealing with law enforcement need to understand and respect those decisions so we do our best to talk to them about it but ultimately it's got to be their decision Henry do you have a short remark we're running to the end of our time yeah very briefly so by statute uh, we do protect whistleblowers that's required by statute so we only disclose their identity if they consent to it that's in the disclosure context obviously for prohibited personnel practices if there is retaliation you know a lot of times we do have with their permission obviously but that's the only way to get a remedy or corrective action in those cases a lot of times but we do absolutely protect whistleblowers identity it's very important thank you I think it's time for us to bring this panel to a close. I want to thank the panelists who make it ever more clear that now more than ever, ever, each of us owes a debt to the whistleblowers and to those people who protect them, who in these times are challenging the waste, fraud, and abuse that threaten our lives these days and the very fabric of our existence. So thank you very much to our panelists. And now I'm going to turn the podium over to John Kostiak for a panel on a highly significant but newer arena to consider the role of whistleblowers, and that is climate change. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, uh, COVID-19 panelists. Uh, for those who are just joining us, I'm John Kostiak, Executive Director of the National Whistleblower Center. I have the privilege of moderating the climate change panel. We're here because we are in a climate emergency. Temperatures suddenly unsuitable for agriculture, disappearing freshwater supplies, massive wildfires, rising seas, storm surges, extreme flooding, Communities around the world are becoming uninhabitable before our very eyes. An exodus of refugees, political instability, all of these frightening trends are accelerating. And to think, there are people in and around the fossil fuel industry who knew decades ago that use of their products was the cause of climate change and had the resources to invest in new energy technologies, but instead launched a campaign of disinformation to con the public into believing that climate change and fossil fuel use is not a serious problem. Climate change is an injustice, the likes of which we've never seen before. We need a new social compact where climate change fraud is widely called out as a threat to our civilization and where positive actions on climate change, not bromides, are rewarded in the marketplace. Fortunately, states, local governments, and others are taking legal action against those who've used deception about climate change and climate change science to block policy solutions. And fortunately, whistleblowers in government, such as Maria Caffrey, Joel Clement, and George Luber, have been providing accurate scientific information on climate change 
enduring personal retaliation from their bosses. Today's panel will focus on what could be called the next generation of climate change whistleblowers, those who expose financial deception, private sector deception about the financial risks of climate change. Those financial risks are twofold, physical threats to assets from climate change extremes and threats to profitability due to improving climate change policies and low carbon technologies. I'm really excited about the panel we've assembled to discuss this. Vina Romani of Ceres will explain why these financial risks are a systemic risk. She's the one who's help we need because she wrote, just wrote a very excellent report with compelling solutions and just a week or so ago organized an important letter to the U.S. financial regulators from the investor community, investors representing over a trillion dollars in assets, explaining why action on these recommendations is so urgently needed. Let me make a quick detour for a shameless plug. National Whistleblower Center also has a report on climate change risk in which we call this risk the ticking time bomb, threatening a global financial implosion. Go to our website and check it out, as well as the exciting new partnership we've launched with Duke University to improve climate risk disclosures. Our distinct message is that we need whistleblowers to help us defuse this ticking time bomb, which is why we're so very fortunate to have Dan Berkowitz here. He's one of the five commissioners that make up the Commodities Future Trading Commission, and he uh, can explain how regulators work with whistleblowers every day to enforce the rules of the marketplace. As one of the nation's top experts on managing financial risk, Dan will help us understand how regulators depend on whistleblowers to deal with deceptions about risk that happen every day when companies describe their financial condition. But first, we're going to kick, off with Kathy, uh, kick things off with Kathy Hibble, who's one of the very best when it comes to explaining what is happening with the fossil fuel industry. We're starting this panel with a discussion of that industry because it's probably the area of greatest need for whistleblowers. It's an industry enormously vulnerable to climate risks, such as competition from low carbon technologies, and one that is very likely to be engaging in deception regarding those risks. Let me just say a few words about Kathy. I'm going to turn it right over as quickly as I can. I want to get to this panel because it's a fantastic panel. Kathy Hipple is a financial analyst at the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis and a finance professor at Bard's MBA program in sustainability. Kathy, I'm turning it over to you. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you to the Center for inviting me to participate in this glorious day. Um, I'd like to, um, just for a very few minutes, give you a background on this industry. Um, are my slides loaded? They are. You should just be able to use your keyboard arrow now to advance them. Great. Okay, so thank you very much again. I'd like to discuss the current state of the oil and gas industry. Um, the spoiler alert is it is in financial distress. It has been in financial distress for at least a decade, likely for longer. Um, first of all, I'm a financial analyst at IEFA, which is an international think tank we produced more than 200 in-depth reports covering energy economics in the United States, in Canada, in Asia, in South America, literally around the world. So we started off covering oil, uh, coal. We've moved more recently into oil and gas and have done a deep dive into the financials of these companies during an extraordinary energy transition. So the question I'm going to offer this morning is, or this afternoon is, does financial distress create pressures and incentives for fraud? And as the center, the whistleblower center and the excellent paper that John just released pointed out, there's a triple fraud conditions. One of them is, are there pressures and incentives as well as opportunity for fraud? And I do not have the depth of knowledge to say there has been fraud. I'm going to discuss has there been pressure on the industry and then potentially opportunity for fraud. OK, so in March, for those of you living under a rock, we know the world changed. Oil prices, gas prices collapsed. The industry would like us to believe this was a black swan event that no one could have predicted. 
But the important thing is the decline began a long time ago, long before the pandemic. The pandemic has only accelerated this. What created this decline? Oddly enough, it was a production boom, a fracking boom led by the United States, primarily gas in the Marcellus Utica region in Appalachia, and production exploded in the more oil producing areas, like mostly the Permian Basin, crude oil led by fracking, led to a revolution called the shale revolution. This caused the United States to become the world's top oil producer and the world's top gas producer. Yet paradoxically, this production boom was accompanied by a financial bust. Here you can see the oil and gas sector represented by an ETF has been down about 70% around the same time the S&P has been up 50%. In fact, the energy sector, which is only oil and gas, it does not include renewable, has been the worst performing sector over the past decade, dead last. And now what we're seeing is that the industry retains tremendous political power, as we have seen, yet it has lost its economic power. Currently, it has less than 3% of the full S&P 500. It represents a diminishing part of the S&P 500. You can see back in 1980, it was about 30%, just under 30%. So the small companies have probably done the worst, the exploration and production companies, the so-called frackers. They lost money year in and year out. Their cash flow was negative. We followed 35 to 50 of them. Many of them have declared bankruptcies because they have a huge amount of debt overhanging them, more bankruptcies are expected. The big companies, the so-called oil majors, we have found that they are in a different kind of financial distress because they have been paying their shareholders in the form of dividends and share buybacks more than their cash flow from operations have generated. So they have to either sell assets or raise debt to continue to fund these generous dividends. So what do we see now? The oversupply in the oil and gas industry that predated the pandemic, it's continuing. Demand forecasts are being cut. Impairments, these are write-offs, these are not good. They are massive jaw-dropping amounts. Companies are cutting their capital expenditures. Debt and equity investors are fleeing. We expect, and so do the international agencies such as IEA, largest recorded demand shocks in history for natural gas. Similarly, the oil market remains fragile with enormous uncertainties. So in conclusion, um, we saw some earnings this morning. It turned out Shell didn't quite report 22 billion of an impairment. It was only 17 billion. That is still a massive impairment. So you can see this is an industry in extremis. Um, the smaller amount for the EMP because the companies are smaller, but in aggregate, the write-offs and impairments are massive for those companies as well. So in short, we are seeing that investors are fleeing the sectors through the first half of the year when the S&P was modestly down. The energy sector, again, that does not include renewable energy, was down 37%. So we have an industry that has been at the bottom of the stock market for a decade, the last two years, the very last, and then through the first half of this year, down significantly. The banks have grown wary. They're pulling their lines of credit. It is not good for this industry. So in conclusion, the gas and oil oversupply is continuing. The bottom line is they have a failing business model. They're facing ongoing financial distress with weak stock returns. Are the conditions ripe for fraud? It's an industry in extremis. And I think I will turn it over to John and my fellow panelists to discuss further whether fraud has come about or whether the conditions are ripe for fraud. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. I would like to turn now to our second panelist. Uh, Dan Berkovitz was nominated by President Trump to serve as a commissioner of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission on 
in April 2018. He was unanimously confirmed by the Senate in August and then was sworn into office on September of 2018 for a five-year term, expiring in 2023. And as you will hear, Dan has deep expertise on regulation of financial misconduct and working with whistleblowers. But Dan, all yours. Thank you, John, and, and thank you to the uh, whistleblower senator for this uh, opportunity at this really uh, important conference. As you've mentioned, uh, I've, I've been following the activities of the center for many years, and it, it, it does great work, and I'm pleased to be here today. Um, if we could go to the first slide as my, my standard disclaimer, uh, the views I express today are my own and not necessarily uh, those of my fellow commissioners or the agency or its staff. So turning to the first slide, what is the Commodity Futures Traded Commission? Who are we and what do we do? We're, we were created in 1974 uh, by the Congress as an independent regulatory agency. We have five commissioners uh, appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, no more than three can be of, of any one party. So currently we have three Republican commissioners and two Democratic senators, uh, two Democratic uh, commissioners, excuse me. Um, we're not really a partisan agency. We're an independent regulatory agency. We have different philosophies, different backgrounds, and that's why we have five members. Uh, and it's uh, a, a healthy environment uh, where you have uh, persons of, of differing philosophies. But we were created in 1974 to regulate the commodity futures and option markets. Uh, prior to 1974, we were an agency within the Department of Agriculture, uh, interestingly, because futures contracts initially, when they started out in the uh, 19th century, uh, related to agricultural products. And a futures contract really is just a contract to deliver something at a future point in time. Uh, they, are, they became standardized and traded on exchanges like Chicago Board of Trade, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, International Intercontinental Exchange. If you've seen the movie Trading Places, a great movie with Eddie, Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd, you'll see the trading pits um, in, in that movie of the New York Mercantile Exchange. There's no more pits. It's all electronic, uh, but that's a, a great explanation of how the, uh, the futures markets work. In 2010, we were given authority to regulate the swaps markets. A swap is very similar to a futures contract, but these develop between financial institutions like banks and industries. Uh, one company would go to a bank and say, I'm worried about the price of oil increasing. Can you give me a swap? You pay me if the price of oil increases, I'll pay you if the price of oil decreases. These were unregulated at the time of the financial crisis and um, uh, widely believed to be a contributing, the unregulation of these instruments uh, was widely believed to be a contributing cause of the crisis. And in the Dodd-Frank Act, we were given the regulatory authority over the swaps markets. Although we have regulatory authority over the commodity futures, options, and swap markets, we can actually regulate how they are traded, the conditions of what they are, are traded under. We also have anti-fraud and anti-manipulation authority over the cash market. So that means any, literally any transaction in any commodity um, the prohibition on fraud and manipulation in the Commodity Exchange Act applies to. Traditionally, we really only exercise this authority over the cash market as it related to futures contracts, if you're manipulating one market to maybe get a benefit in another. But we've seen recently with cryptocurrency, extensive fraud um, and, and, and problems in the, in the cryptocurrency markets, Ponzi schemes, misrepresentations, and we've actually exercised our anti-fraud and anti-manipulation authority over the, the cash markets in those commodities. So our, our anti-fraud and anti-manipulation authority in terms of commodities and interstate commerce is actually very broad. It goes to the regulated instruments, but any transaction really of a commodity in interstate commerce. And I would add that a commodity is not just something like corn, wheat, oil, gold, aluminum, or a metal. A commodity can be something like a cryptocurrency, a commodity can be a financial uh, index. It can be an interest rate. It can be a, a currency rate. It can really encompass a wide variety of things. So the definition of commodity itself is very, very broad. Uh, hey, Dan, we have uh, anti Pardon? A little left in your presentation. Yes. Um, so we have a whistleblower program. If we could move on to the whistleblower program, it was created in the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, these are the reg regulatory sites. The next slide. Uh, we've, it's been very productive program. We've awarded over $110 million. 
uh, to 20 whistleblowers. These whistleblowers have contributed uh, to actions that have led to $900 million in penalties. Next slide. Information about who can be a whistleblower, voluntarily provided original information resulting in an action greater than $1 million. Uh, next slide. The whistleblower is entitled to 10 to 30 percent of the CFTC collection in cases over a million dollars. Uh, and the, the awards don't come from restitution, they come from the whistleblower fund. We have similar protections as shown on the next slide. Uh, anonymity, um, uh, we have uh, protections against retaliation. Um, and uh, not only do we protect the whistleblower, but the whistleblower itself would have a cause of action against the employer uh, for um, a retaliation. Uh, we have many tips. Uh, it's very effective. 40% uh, of our enforcement investigations involve a whistleblower, a wide variety of subjects, um, uh, many disclosure violations, fraud. Uh, uh, and if I could turn to a couple of slides, more slides, the next one. This is, we got the great website. Somebody was on the ball when our, when our office was created a number of years ago, www.whistleblower.gov. So we, we, we've got a great website uh, to look at for further information on the program. And there's information in here about the contacts in the program. Uh, Chris Ehrman, the director of the program, the contact email for the whistleblower office and uh, 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 happy to answer any, any questions and, and discuss the program. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dan. I would now like to introduce our final panelist, Vina Roman. Vina leads Sirius' work on critical market levers that help scale the transition to a sustainable capital markets. She also oversees Sirius' work to engage financial regulators on climate change as a systemic risk. I mean, under the umbrella of the Sirius Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets. And Vina, why don't you take it over? Oh, great. And John, again, thanks very much um, to you. Thanks very much to the National Whistleblower Center for inviting me to speak. And it's really fun to be going at the end of this panel, sort of behind sort of Kathy, Dan and yourself, because Kathy sort of did a really great job in setting the stage as to the financial risk that climate change poses to a really critical industry. Um, Dan talked about the role of financial regulators and you, John, talked about a really exciting new report um, from the National Whistleblower Center, again, calling attention to the importance of robust disclosure and importantly, the lack thereof that we may be seeing in, in a critical industry. So what I'm gonna try to do um, in my presentation is try to weave these themes together, especially in the context of a, a new report that we just released uh, a month and a half ago. So um, let me sort of provide a few minutes of context. So the evidence is increasingly clear that um, climate change poses impacts that are not only financial to companies or even material to companies and industries, as um, Kathy's presentations demonstrated. The work that we've done shows that these impacts are so profound and so pervasive that climate change in fact can be categorized as what we call a systemic risk or a risk that poses threats to the very stability of financial markets, both domestically and globally. And this categorization of climate change as a systemic risk is important because when we define climate as being a systemic risk, it automatically belongs on the mandate of financial regulators who have the job of essentially protecting the safety and the soundness of US financial markets. And importantly, from our perspective, have the power to issue regulations that would force markets to factor in climate change into their valuations and their decision making. So in fact, as, as John mentioned, Sirius released a report just last month, again, making the case that climate poses a risk to US financial markets and calling on US financial regulators to address this issue as a part of their existing mandates. So we call uh, on US regulators and here, uh, the scope of our report includes banking regulators, so the Fed, the OCC, the, F, uh, the FDIC, uh, market regulators, so the SEC, but also um, Dan, the, the CFTC. Um, it includes um, insurance regulators, it includes the Federal Housing Finance Agency, as well as the Financial Stability Oversight Council. And, and we have 51 specific recommendations to the report. Do not worry, I will not list them all in detail. But what I will do is sort of talk about the categories. So we, we call on financial regulators to do four buckets of things. We call them to affirm that climate change is a risk and begin the research on the impacts of this risk on their jurisdictions. We call on regulators to integrate climate change into their supervision of key industries and markets, again, and the role of um, whistleblowers is, is critically important to this function as well. 
Um, we call on regulators to issue rules for climate change disclosure, and this is what I'm going to focus on in just a minute. And finally, we call on regulators to coordinate both between themselves as well as their global counterparts so that there is essentially a coordinated playbook forward um, on what is at the end of the day a global issue. Now, we do call regulators to do a lot of things, but from our perspective, disclosure is fundamental to a lot of this. Um, we see disclosure, robust climate change disclosure as being fundamental to everything that we want financial regulators to do, as well as being fundamental to the broader change that we're looking to see in capital markets. Regulators simply cannot do the kind of macroeconomic analysis we need them to do on the impacts of climate change on industries like the oil, oil and gas sector, um, or, or even at a market level without widespread firm level disclosure. And, and forget regulators, I mean, even when you start to bring this down to the level of individual investors, investors and financial firms cannot do the kind of company level and industry level analysis that they need for their decision making without widespread and importantly from our purposes, robust and reliable climate change disclosure. So uh, you know, a couple of minutes about where we are in the climate change disclosure marketplace. We have seen the volume of climate change disclosure increase in leaps and bounds, but the reality is that the quality of the disclosure is still not what we call decision useful. It's, it's really not what we need. Most of the disclosure is still coming from large companies. Even where the firms are disclosing, they're not actually disclosing metrics that are in fact useful to disclosures. There are wide gaps in what is being disclosed. Again, what's relevant for this conversation is very little of what is disclosed is in fact externally verified. And as the National Whistleblowers Report notes, um, we are in fact seeing significant instances of either under-reporting or misrepresenting, misrepresentation of the actual risks that a lot of companies face. So at this point, companies do in fact have a legal obligation to disclose material issues, but the determination of what counts as material versus not is in fact left in the hands of the companies, which creates a, a fundamental problem. Um, and again, given the systemic nature that climate change poses to our global financial systems, um, there is, we believe, a need to regulate and mandate climate change disclosures. Um, but clearly what we need is also support of, of the role of whistleblowers to both draw attention to any uh, misstatements as well as omissions. So let me stop there. Excellent, actually, it really did nicely tie it all together. Thank you, Veena, that was really helpful. Because uh, I know your report and your work has a lot more to it than just a disclosure piece, but in some other conference we'll find time for all of that. But we have this, uh, I think, fascinating conversation to be had about the work that's been done so far in disclosures and what people are seeing in financial statements and why that is inadequate for investors, why it's inadequate for financial regulators, and then what can we do about that? Um, we know that the primary approach that's been taken up until now has been essentially a voluntary one and very important work on voluntary standards. Uh, I would invite any of you to, or all of you to comment on what is the logical next step we have the Dodd-Frank Act that basically was created to deal with a similar problem, right, um, in 2008. Now we have a problem that potentially is a much larger scale. And can we take some of the concepts from the Dodd-Frank Act and apply them to climate risk disclosure? Can we say that can we can we get more specific i guess is my point and and more directive on uh, the robustness of disclosures can we deal specifically with accounting standards i'm just going to sort of leave a wide open question for the three of you to say if you were trying to have a healthier a better functioning market right now and accepted my premise that better information sharing makes a better functioning market what would you do next Well, let, let me let me just uh, explain actually what we are do, what we are doing in, in, in this area. Uh, one of one of the lessons from from the financial crisis is um, there was inadequate consideration of the, the very risks that were building up in the financial system uh, back in, in in that time frame. The risks uh, that were building up in the in the housing market and the exposures uh, potentially to over uh, exposed in housing and and too much. Uh, Build up a risk there, and that was transmitted to the financial institutions. One of the things that we're trying to uh, uh, get a, get a handle on, and that has been brought to our attention, 
um, uh, is the buildup of, of risks of the financial system through uh, climate change, that all the financial models and all the, the, the corporations are, um, are they adequately considering these fundamental threats to their viability? I think Kathy's presentation indicated many of the, the risks to the oil and gas, the energy sector, which is invested in, heavily invested in fossil fuels. Are they sufficiently looking forward, taking into account climate risks in, the, in their business lines? And are the financial institutions that are uh, basing their financial instruments on certain outlooks in terms of energy prices and, and uh, economic conditions adequately taking those risks into consideration, the design of the financial instruments, and is there indeed a buildup of this type of risk that we're not paying sufficiently att uh, sufficient attention to? We have advisory committees. The CFTC has a number of advisory committees. One of those is the Market Risk Advisory Committee, and that's the exact question the Market Risk Advisory Committee is looking at. It's uh, consists of 35 members, extremely distinguished uh, backgrounds in climate change and economics and finance, uh, some of the real leaders in this area who uh, are, are developing a report for the commission, which would really be the first time we really seriously looked at this with recommendations. How should we incorporate this in, into our framework? So that, that report hopefully will be provided uh, to us uh, very shortly. This August, September timeframe is the current Time frame, so that's that's what we're uh, looking at those very topical issues and how to incorporate it. Um, I'm, oh, go ahead, Kathy. <laughs> um, and I would point out that there is a phenomenal tool that is really less than five years old, um, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, which I admit is a is a mouthful, um, TCSD. So companies, if um, investors with a lot of funds, for example, the largest pension fund in the world, um, the Japanese pension fund and the Norwegian pension fund, if they begin looking through that lens and requiring their investees um, to issue a TCFD report, it's a great start. BlackRock has notably said that they are going to be more rigorous in demanding that. And I would also just compliment uh, the C, um, Commodity Futures Trading Commission uh, because they have hired Bob Litterman to have a prominent role in looking at risk. And he comes from a background in the financial sector at Goldman Sachs where he looked at financial risk. And as he pointed out, you can't remove risk, but you have to price in risk. And we have to know what risk we are looking at in our investments. And then to Vina's standpoint, we have to really consider how it contributes to systemic risk. So there's already a tool out there. Um, I believe every company should have to report on this, but as we know, it's currently voluntary. Yeah, and, and Kathy sort of gave me a great opening because one of the recommendations in our report is for the SEC to actually mandate the use of TCFD disclosures. Um, I, I completely agree with you, Kathy, that the TCFD is sort of the, the tool to sort of um, put your hat on if you don't mind me, you know, mashing a few analogies there. The Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure is a tool that was created for the financial industry, by the financial industry, for finan the financial industry, right? So what um, disclosures are investors looking for about climate change, which they can use to factor into their decision making. I think the TCFD itself, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of support of the TCFD. You had, you know, over 400 uh, investors globally sort of, you know, essentially saying they support the TCFD. The TCFD is the fundamental linchpin around the organization of the Climate Action 100 Plus Initiative. 500 investors globally representing $40 trillion of assets, engaging the largest fossil fuel companies in the world on their climate strategies and disclosures. But while investor engagement is a, a very, very important and significant path forward, it can't be the only path forward in our judgment, right? Just because we need disclosure to happen at the scale and at a time frame, which is rapidly shrinking. The IPCC 1.5C report um, you know, showed us that we have less than a decade and a decade to act with ambition before the um, impacts of climate change, the, the more ca catastrophic impacts of climate change become irreversible. Again, we have had the SEC in 2010 issue guidance, interpretive guidance on climate risk disclosure. Climate change disclosure in financial filings has increased, but the analysis that we've done shows that a lot of the disclosure is still boilerplate. 
right? So it's, it's, it's basically pro forma rather than meaningful. That's not true of all companies, clearly, but change is happening, it's happening too slowly. If you take a look at the comment letters that the SEC has issued on climate change, they can be counted in this past year on fingers of one hand, right? So there's not a lot of enforcement. So again, so what we call for in this report is for the SEC to issue rules for climate change disclosure and for the SEC to coordinate with other regulatory bodies, including the Fed, including the banking regulators, as well as the entire um, national financial regulatory ecosystem, again, to have a coordinated approach um, on how climate risk can be addressed going forward. This has really been a fantastic conversation. And of course, it's now we're out of time and when I feel like we're just getting warmed up, I hope we can find another time to reconvene and speak at greater length. But for now, I must thank you for your generous contributions and insights. Uh, we really do have the A-team here, and I, I know you're introducing new concepts to a large number of people, and I think it's really valuable. So thank you so much. I am now going to turn uh, over the program uh, to our final uh, panel, led by Mark Tony, uh, who is the Executive Director of the Utility Reform Network in San Francisco. And most importantly, from my perspective, uh, one of the members of the board of directors of the National Whistleblower Center. And Mark will uh, lead us on the panel of uh, tools for whistleblowers. Thank you very much, John. I, I am just incredibly privileged to introduce a group of outstanding panelists who are here to talk about the system of laws and tools that protect whistleblowers as they put their reputations, their careers, and sometimes their very lives on the line, as they speak out to expose police misconduct, racial violence, misspending of COVID relief funds, and deceptive climate changes that they have witnessed with their very own eyes. Each speaker will make a three minute introductory statement after which we will entertain about 10 minutes of questions and answers afterwards, uh, given that we have enough time. So the first panelist I'd like to introduce is Robert Jackson. Welcome, Robert. Uh, Robert is professor of law and co-director of the Institute for Corporate Governance and Finance at the New York University School of Law and former commissioner of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Robert, it's all yours. Well, thank you so much uh, for that very kind introduction. I know I'm delighted to be here. Um, and um, I don't know about all of you, but I've learned so much from all of the conversations today in the, in the previous uh, panel in particular. So what I'll do is be brief. Um, I'm also, I had the great privilege of being on with panelists who have behind the scenes been fighting with and for whistleblowers for many, many years. So I'm going to um, just briefly give um, my high level uh, introductory thoughts and then um, um, hand it back to you, Mark, for conversation with my colleagues. Um, it is crucial that everybody who um, works with, advises, and understands the process that a whistleblower goes through, has at their disposal um, uh, the tools and options that um, uh, the whistleblower protection laws that we have in the United States, um, in particular at the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, um, uh, give to those who, as Mark says, are putting their livelihoods and their lives at risk when they come forward um, uh, to reveal a fraud. Now, as Mark pointed out, my experience was at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and while I was on that agency, there um, was, among other things, there were proposals that would have made the process for coming forward um, uh, uh, more uh, difficult, less certain, and um, in particular, more full of pitfalls that a whistleblower might step into as they um, considered coming forward. In particular, um, uh, the, uh, the, a proposal that was advanced uh, while I was on the commission um, um, uh, suggested uh, in some passages that whistleblowers who came forward um, and filed a report early before they uh, obtained uh, counsel and assistance with that process might later find themselves foreclosed by their previous reporting to the commission um, um, uh, 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 when they uh, tried to bring a whistleblower claim. They, the, the proposal also suggested uh, that awards for whistleblowers might uh, be subject to reductions 
um, uh, by political appointees at the agencies. Um, and I, I'm proud of many things um, that I did while I was a commissioner at the SEC. Um, but the thing I'm proudest of is having fought back against that proposal. Um, and the reason I'm proud of it, um, and I did that with the help of many people in this community and in this conversation, is because um, I try very hard when I was a policymaker to put myself in the place of the people we are asking to help us um, uh, enforce the laws. And if you spend even a moment, I don't have the experience that my colleagues on this panel do, um, um, sitting with them and working through that process, but if you even for a moment imagine what it's like to ask somebody uh, to put their lives on the line, um, uh, to help us um, have a better um, market, uh, law, and nation. Um, uh, if you think what you're really asking of them, what you must do is make it as easy as possible uh, for them to access the process, to be honest about what they've seen and why it's troubling, and to be compensated fairly for the risk that they took. Um, and uh, what we'll talk about today, Mark, as you know, is the tools that are available at the SEC for doing that. Um, but I'm delighted to say that that proposal, which was made uh, well over a year ago, has not yet finalize those changes. Um, and I'm hopeful that we're going to persuade my co my former colleagues on the commission um, to keep these things well in mind before they make any of those changes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. And we'll get an opportunity to talk a little bit more about that in questions and answers. Um, my great privilege to introduce Stephen Cohn, the co-founder and chairman of the board for the National Whistleblower Center. Um, he's recognized widely recognized as the most impactful whistleblower attorney in the U.S. His research is what led to the rediscovery of America's first whistleblower law adopted 242 years ago today on July 30th, 1778. And if I just may say, I first met Steve in 1980, 40 years ago, and I've been a fan ever since. Stephen. Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, it's an honor to be here, an honor to be on this panel, and to see people whom I know have worked so hard for protecting whistleblowers and human rights. And it's just great to be here. Uh, the I, I'm here to say about the tools for whistleblowers. And this is a very important message. They have improved. They have in some ways been re a, a revolution. So yes, we hear about retaliation and it exists. And many of the whistleblower laws protecting employees from retaliation have been improved. But at the end of the day, you always lose. If, if you blow the whistle and are subject to retaliation, your name is known in the industry you're gonna get blacklisted. Even if your order is reinstated, your career path will be stalled. And we've lived through that for many years. To correct that injustice and to incentivize whistleblowers who are the most important source of fraud and fraud detection in the country and in the world, Congress has taken action. And these are the new tools, and they're still not widely known. First, your right to report anonymously and confidentially has been significantly expanded. I have now been working with the SEC, the Department of Justice, and the Internal Revenue Service, and they have, in case after case, religiously protected the identity and confidentiality of the whistleblower. To the point where my largest case ever, the company never even knew there was a whistleblower. So if you want to be protected and the, comp and the company doesn't know who you are, you're pretty much not going to be retaliated against. This is a major advance. The second is payment of rewards. In the old days, and still in retaliation, you got paid if you won but the amount of damage was how much you suffered. The more you suffered, the more you got. Who wanted to get a big judgment? Who wanted to have their careers destroyed for years or suffer severe emotional distress? The reward laws flipped that. Your compensation is based on the quality of your information and the ability to hold corrupt 
officials and wrongdoers accountable. You get a percentage of the successful prosecution. In other words, you're incentivized to come forward with the best information, you can do it anonymously, and you can be compensated for the risks you are really taking. So these are the new tools, and, and it's very important for the entire whistleblower community to understand that these tools are effective and will work. Thank you, Mark, and everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I, I'm impressed you kept it to three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to round out this panel, we are so fortunate today to have Donna Boemi, the lion of compliance. She is an internationally recognized authority on organizational compliance and ethics. She has been recognized as a recipient of the 2014 Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics International Award the 2019 Honoree of Lifetime Achievement Award from Trust Across America, Trust Around the World. And just so fortunate and appreciate you joining us today, Donna. I'm gonna turn it over to you. you. Um, hey, Donna, we can't quite hear you. I'm sorry, take, take a look at your mute button. Donna, it's the top left can part. Yes, we, yeah, we can hear you. you now, Donna. Okay, you. that's great. Thank you, Mark. It's an honor and a pleasure to be part of this learned panel and to celebrate uh, on this virtual conference, National Whistleblower Appreciation Day. Um, I think it's really important that every year um, we have this day to recognize and support the noble and important role of the whistleblower in our democracy, um, which has been that case since, uh, since this day in 1778. Um, I'd like to talk about the internal tools that are available to whistleblowers, uh, which really in most companies uh, today is the internal hotline or ethics line or helpline it might be called. Um, about a about a decade ago, when the SEC was considering their final rules for the Dodd Frank whistleblower program, Steve asked me to speak to a number of the SEC commissioners about the linkage between corporate compliance, which has its tools to raise uh, whistleblower concerns up to uh, to senior management, so that those uh, problems can be taken care of. And I wanted to talk to the commissioners about the linkage between corporate compliance, which is where at first uh, most whistleblowers start, uh, and, uh, and the, the program that they were considering. And I told each of the commissioners that if, if my own sister were asking me internally, should she call her helpline in her company because she had something she wanted to report, I told each of them that if my sister had asked me, I would have said, well, the most important thing you need to research is who is in charge of overseeing and managing that helpline program. Is it the general counsel and legal? Or is there an independent corporate compliance officer with experience and uh, subject matter expertise knows what they're doing and has the independence and the empowerment to uh, manage that program. Because it's really the chief compliance officer and the compliance department's mandate to raise problems up to senior levels through uh, those that are raised on the helpline and in other means. And unfortunately at that time, what I told the, the commissioners was that most corporate compliance programs did not work. They were broken because they were being run by legal. They were being covered by legal under the legal mandate to protect and defend the company, not the, not the compliance mandate, which is to find problems and fix problems and to prevent problems and bring them up to senior levels where they could be uh, fixed. And so 
that major tool, the helpline, which is where most whistleblowers start, is uh, problematic. And I told the commissioners, most corporate uh, programs are, are broken. And at that time that I said that, I think 80, 80 to 90% of all corporate compliance programs were vested in the legal department and was run by uh, legal or somebody buried in legal. Um, there was one company where the helpline rang on the desk of the general counsel. Um, and I'm happy to say that today, because of work of a lot of people in the compliance profession, um, that difference has now been understood and fewer and fewer uh, compliance programs are being run through legal. And the ones who are independent and the best programs are run by an independent chief compliance officer with experience and expertise. So that figure is from 80 to 90% down to almost, I think it's 41% last time I looked. Uh, so that is an important question when you are using the tool internally of the helpline is to look carefully at the independence and empowerment of your compliance officer. How are they positioned? What's their seniority? And what is their experience? Thank, thank, thank you, Donna. I, I really appreciate the specificity by which you identified how uh, employees can uh, be, be able to determine if the corporate um, hotline is the right place to go. Um, what I'd like to do is go to questions um, for the panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, our time is tight and my job is to keep us on a schedule. So I'm gonna start with you, Robert. Um, I'd like you to talk about um, actually following up something that you said, why is it important for whistleblowers to seek advice of counsel before blowing the whistle? And particularly when it comes to the um, what attorneys can do to assist with the SEC whistleblower program and using the protections in Dodd-Frank Act? Uh, well, thank you, Mark. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer um, uh, directly and quickly. Um, I urge everybody out there who's thinking about um, coming forward and revealing what's troubling them and what they've seen um, to, um, uh, to use whistleblower counsel. Um, because the advice um, and guidance you get is invaluable in a process that we at the SEC are trying to make easier. We're trying to make more transparent, but still comes with all kinds of pitfalls, large and small, um, and um, uh, clear and hidden. Um, just to give one example, um, uh, when you engage uh, in an SEC, when you're considering an SEC whistleblower complaint, there are various stages at the process when you will actually come forward to the office at the SEC and share the details uh, of, of, of what you've seen. Um, the moment that you choose for that uh, for that revelation, the um, context in which it occurs, all of the different, um, the degree of um, evidence you're able to marshal at the beginning of that, all of those things um, are things that counsel have to understand well before um, the whistleblower engages with the agency. Um, and of course, Donna will be able to say more about the internal processes um, um, uh, that will have to um, have informed that, uh, those decisions. So um, uh, especially at the commission, um, uh, if you're thinking about engaging with us, having the assistance of whistleblower counsel is really invaluable. Terrific. Thank you very much, Robert. So, so, so Steve, what I want to ask you is, you know, you've represented countless uh, whistleblowers in your career. What is the most important one thing that whistleblower, whistleblowers need to know if they want to see justice done and protect themselves from retaliation? Sure. Number one is to know your rights before you open your mouth. It's as simple as that. It's kind of comes back to the get good counsel, know what your rights are. It's a crazy world. Who you blow the whistle to can determine whether you have no rights at all or maybe can collect a million dollar award. Also, for example, anonymity. You blow the whistle even to the SEC on your own, you have no rights to be anonymous. But if you come in through a lawyer, you can be. So these very important initial steps and then also how you articulate your whistleblower concern can determine whether you're in or you're out. So 
And the other problem is, so, you under, so everyone understands it, there's no one whistleblower law. There's about 60 whistleblower laws covering all different segments of the economy. There's one for tax, one for securities, one for government fraud, one for tax evasion, one for money laundering. So unless you understand what you're blowing the whistle on and how to put the circle in the circle, you're in trouble. So know your rights. Okay, Steve, I think that was pretty clear. I had no idea myself that there were dozens and dozens of whistleblower laws. Um, so that, that, that makes a big difference. You got to know which law applies to which situation, and that's why you need an experienced whistleblower attorney. Okay, so, so, so Donna, uh, I want to go back to corporate practices. And I want to talk about best practices for a minute, okay? And what are the one or two best corporate practices? You started talking about one earlier, but what are one or two other best corporate practices when it comes to protecting whistleblowers from retaliation? And which companies do you think are taking the lead in promoting whistleblower disclosures, you know, having, you know, model policies? Okay, well, I think that one of the most important things that companies can do to professionalize their whistleblower program is to have guidelines that are uh, clear on certain areas that make the whistleblower program effective. So it would be, those guidelines would cover independence, would cover uh, lack of conflict of interest, confidentiality, non-retaliation, and professionalism. Uh, so we created in one of my earlier seco uh, jobs a model set of whistle of uh, investigation guidelines because we noticed that so many uh investigations were being handled by people who had no experience and really were just winging it so you got former law enforcement fbi uh former auditors and security personnel with no uh experience and they were um managing investigations in a way that, you know, they maybe watched on TV, uh, on Columbo or something. And, uh, and we did not have a consistent and professional way to protect our whistleblowers and to raise the complaint steadily and fairly to the right people who could resolve it. And so one of the best things I think companies can do and one of the things I ask when I go in to assess companies is, what are your uh, investigation guidelines? And what kind of training do you have for the people that lead investigations? That's really important. So uh, now your next question is, uh, what companies are are doing this well? Well, I've I've been, you know I've I've evaluated a lot of companies. I will say that a number of uh, financial institutions uh, do have some investigation guidelines and professional training in place because they know how serious it is to get their um their ducks in a row with respect to whistleblowers and protect them and make them feel confident to come forward if they've got a concern uh and so and i'll say that uh that uh, novartis is another company that is taking great strides in many respects and some other healthcare companies as well because again it's very critical to their underlying business to make sure that they're aware of any problems before those problems explode um so they i will tell you that i'll say did i'll flip it and say the three biggest scandals that we know of which are examples of companies that failed companies that knew about these problems internally for years sometimes a decade and never fixed them are gm with its uh delayed uh uh ignition switch recall where over 100 people died uh the um uh and uh, G GM and uh, the VW with their uh, emissions cheating scandal, the software. They knew about that for at least a decade. Uh, people had tried to come forward, but they were never listened to and the investigation went awry. And the third would be Wells Fargo, where the problems were known for many years and people who called what they called the ethics line were routinely fired, called in and fired for raising the concern. Uh, and so they could have gotten ahead of that had they known about it. They could have managed it, but they did not. So 
that's, that's an example of companies that have completely failed. Companies have completely failed. I mean, what we have today on this panel that is so significant is three prongs of whistleblower compliance. What we have is the advocacy represented by Steve Cohn to represent whistleblowers and do the lit litigation. We've got Robert Jackson, who's representing the regulatory um, strategy of how to regulate companies. And then we have Donna, who's on the inside, who is pushing corporations into voluntary compliance. And really, we need all three to work together to be able to be successful. And that's what I feel is very unique about this particular panel that was put together. I um, really apologize that we don't have time for more questions, that um, my job is to make sure that we stay on time. I want to thank each of you for your comments and for all of the work that you have done and all of the work that you are going to continue to do. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. John? Thank you, Mark. And this thank, you. thank you so much. I think this panel was fantastic, and I'm grateful to all of you. I'm grateful to everyone who participated in this conference, both panelists, speakers, and the attendees. If you're like me, you're saying, wow, you touched on issues of great complexity, and we did not give it nearly enough time. Well, I have two suggestions on that front. And then we're going to wrap it up. One is you'll be getting an email in the next couple of days uh, from the conference organizers uh, with recordings of these uh, presentations. So go back uh, and uh, you know pick out some of the speakers that you wanted to hear more from and listen to what they have to say. Feel free to follow up with them. Uh, the other thing is go to the uh, National Whistleblower website or check us out on social media. We've got a lot of educational resources. Um, we have an action network if you want to help, if you were inspired today, which I hope you were, and you want to help get stronger whistleblower protections, uh, we use our uh, action network list to uh, make significant progress on policy by letting uh, members of Congress and other key policymakers know that there's a uh, public that cares deeply about the subject. So uh, go to our website, sign up for the action site, uh, engage with us on social media. We'd love to be in conversation with our supporters and uh, look forward to staying in touch with all of you. And uh, we'll be back next year, hopefully in person, but perhaps uh, virtually again. And uh, look, we're finishing on time, very proud of that. Uh, and thanks again and happy National Whistleblower Day. <laughs>